Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for the Office of Global Initiative and also big thanks to the NBA Emerging Market Association for supporting this event together and providing the food and the drink. I'm sure we all appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Mario Leonel. I'm a full-time MBA student here at the University of Maryland and I am from Brazil. Uh, I moved from Brazil to the U.S. exactly 14 years ago, in the year 2000. And back then, the first few years when I was here, every time somebody found out I was from Brazil, they would ask me questions like soccer related, or about carnival, or about the Amazon, and so on. You know, very like party, fun, thing type of questions. And as the year have progressed, I can see that the face of Brazil to the world has changed because now I have MBA students coming up to me and asking about job openings, job prospects in Brazil. As I went through my internship search, you know, talking to all the different companies, they were all asking me questions about the Brazilian market, about entering the Brazilian market and expanding their business. So I find it very interesting how to think about it, just a few years, Brazil went from being this very like party, fun country, to a more you know, business oriented. And so that's very interesting to me. And going moving forward, as you probably know, this summer Brazil is hosting the World Cup. And in two years from now, Brazil will be hosting the Summer Olympics. These are you know, very exciting times for, for Brazilians, because we want to see which Brazil is going to show up. The new, this new Brazil that everyone is expecting, or the old Brazil, you know, with infrastructure problems, corruptions, delays. So very fun times and very exciting times for Brazil as a country as a whole. So on this note, uh, Dr. Prochno, he got his bachelor's degree from the University of Sao Paulo. He has an MBA from Vanderbilt and a PhD in management from INSEAD. He has written numerous articles in the management field, and he has been here at Smith for seven years. So please help me welcome Dr. Paul Brockman. So I better start with some disclaimers. First disclaimer, I'm not an economist. As you mentioned, I'm an engineer. We we're going to be talking about some things that have to do with economics. It's going to be, it's going to be an oversimplified view uh, of economics, but um, we have only one hour, so we have to cover a lot of different topics. Second, uh, as I was looking at what, when Matt first invited me, okay, th th this is a series about barriers, barriers to doing business in different countries, and I said, no, but we should put there the opportunities as well. And then, as I was preparing this topic, uh, I said, Probably we won't have time to go into the opportunities, so it's the same. If you are here because, if you are looking for opportunities, uh, we're going to have to do a follow-up session on that. Uh, so if by the end if you're a little depressed, no, okay, hopefully not. And, uh, if I get to the end, we'll probably get to some uh, interesting uh, opportunities. And, and the last thing is, this is uh, also what we talk, we, I'll, I'll be talking about some macroeconomic issues because those are relevant, that those influence a lot of what goes on there. But also we will try to talk about the cross-cultural issues as well, things that have to do with doing business in Brazil and the cultural uh, differences that we would have by doing business there. So we'll try to uh, cover that point also. And I, and I will tell you also the, why that, that point is important as we go through the uh, and the, the plan is to do something like 40, 45 minutes and then open for questions for 15, 20 minutes. <coughs> so uh, if you have followed Brazil, you know Brazil, uh, Goldman Sachs created the BRICS acronym. Uh, Brazil, Russia, and China became the hot thing and investors, a lot of money flowing into those countries. But then in the past two years or so, Brazil has been called one of the fragile five countries. So. That has been a change in perception going on in the past couple of years or so. We're going to try to understand why this is, has happened and uh, also see then what could be uh, some of the opportunities there. So that, 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 that's the great story. The cover of the economy is in 2009, Brazil taking off, seventh largest economy in the world, close to the UK, so sometimes it's six, sometimes it's seven. 
Uh, significant reduction of poverty over the past 12 years. The next slide shows a little more on that story. Uh, budget has been balanced, so uh, Brazil has had a primary surplus since 1998, uh, and a trade surplus since 2001. So this is our good news in terms of uh, government finances. World's leading export of a number of different things like our war, coffee, sardines, orange juice, beef, chicken, sugar, and ethanol, but also, for example, uh, Embraer, this is the number three or number four airplane, a commercial airplane manufacturer, so the, the, there is also a segment more in the high tech that also competes globally. Unemployment is a uh, record low levels, and Mar last month was 5%, so it has been going down consistently for the past 10 years or so. Uh, even during the crisis, during the crisis, unemployment did not go up during the 2008-2009 crisis. Uh, Strong local companies, JBS is the number one worldwide in, uh, they define it as protein processing. It's all meats, uh, all types of different meats, they own different companies in the US, Embraer in airplanes, Odebrecht, they are number 13 in uh, contractors in the rank of contractors. They're a pretty large contractor. They do a lot of work in Africa, for example. Uh, Gerdau is the largest long steel producer in Americas. Uh, vale, Iron War, uh, very strong presence worldwide. And Petrobras, which if you have, if you know a little about Petrobras, was five years ago or so was the hot thing. There were a lot of, Brazil has had a lot of discoveries in oil. It's a very deep water uh, uh, part of the, the Atlantic Ocean. So it requires very sophisticated technologies. It's expensive to extract oil, but huge potential discoveries that by 2025, Brazil would be one of the top oil producers in the world. Uh, lately, Petrobras has been under a lot of each different issues, and I think you should buy their shares because they are undervalued. Okay, this is a disclaimer, I'm not in the concept. But, <laughs> so, so there are something going on there that are, I mean, in terms of valuation, some of these companies are under, some are overvalued, some are undervalued, better value that would be undervalued. But not only that, I mean, if you think, now Brazilians have only zero control of things, brands like Anheuser Busch, uh, Burger King, Heinz, Watch out, Coca-Cola and Procter Gamble, Brazilians are after you. So that's kind of Brazilian imperial buying. Uh, so all those companies are now won by a group of investors that the majority of them are Brazilians. And hosting the major sport events, World Cup, the Olympics, and we will win the World Cup, so there is no question about that. <laughs> and we will beat US again, like we did in the previous uh, and then uh, also clean energy. Brazil is quite, the, the, the energy matrix of Brazil is quite good. You have uh, most of electricity is hydroelectric. It's close to 80% of electricity coming from hydroelectric power. Plus you have the ethanol. I mean, since the 80s, Brazil has used ethanol for cars. So it's sugar cane based, which is uh, more efficient than the farm based ethanol. So in 2012, 40. 2.4% of Brazil's energy matrix coming from renewable sources versus 8.2% for OECD and 13.2% for the world. So that's pretty good and that's something that if you uh, add the non-clean energy, the oil discoveries of Brazil, <coughs> so this, this idea of energy independence it is, it is why Brazil has a good future there. Uh, so that's uh, the economist was did a whole special section about Brazil in 2009, and that, that's the Brazil that is working pretty well. Interest rates have been pretty high in Brazil for a long time. A lot of structural issues behind that, but the major issue there is that there is always the threat of inflation. I grew up with hyperinflation. I had months where inflation was 80% in the month. So there was prices were going up every day, basically. So, so Brazil had a history of very strong inflation. It was very hard to fight that process. So, but 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 still, the, the, there is a residual kind of threat of inflation that is always there. So uh, the interest rates have been pretty high. So this is the, the this is the base rate of the uh, government, and that's the the green one is the inflation. So inflation 
has moved down. You see a trend moving down, the interest rates moving down a lot. And uh, here, uh, the columns, you have the real interest rate the difference between uh, the base interest rate and the inflation. So you see that real interest. So think about, I mean, 2005, real interest rate, this is fixed income, no risk, 12%. Any investment you make, any productive investment, the internal rate of return has to be higher than that. So that that is a barrier for growth because if you have if you have 12% real interest rate, just putting your money in the bank, safe, the outcomes in terms of entrepreneurship, risk taking, etc. So so for a long time, interest rates were. A huge problem that you see here that's going down, down, down. That's part of that dynamics of growth. So uh, interest rates going down. What happened? People started to take credits. So now it had it is still expensive, but it's much more affordable than it used to be in the past. So you have here a uh, credit uh, percentage in terms of GDP going up from 2008 was 27.4 percent, uh, and then going up to 53% in 2012, and mortgage going up a little bit, but you see mortgage is still a low number in terms of GDP numbers. If you compare to other countries, credit divided by GDP, it's still quite low. So you can see this as an opportunity. I mean, if you start having, I mean, if the low interest rates become a more stable kind of fact in Brazil, you have a potential here of expansion based on credit that is potentially huge. So that's something that uh, a lot of the growth in the past few years has been fueled by this expansion of credit. And the expansion of the middle class. So uh, that's 2003. That's percentage of uh, low class, middle class, and upper class. Brazil, in fact, has five different uh, classes, they, they call A, B, C, D, E, but here it's bundling together D and E, C and A and B, so uh, the, the, the C is uh, the, the regular middle class, and it has expanded from 2003 to 2013, 38 to 54%, so that's a huge jump in the middle class. Why that happened? We, we'll see the dynamics uh, of growth, so most of that came because the country was growing, new jobs being uh, offered, but also that happened partially due to government policies. Uh, Lula became president, if you know the, the history of Brazil, Lula was uh, from the Workers' Party, he was uh, a union leader, and he ran for presidency three times, lost, 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 and then, the, then he finally won, and then that time when he was elected, uh, 2002, end of 2002, the investors were afraid that he would be a radical leftist. Uh, but he was pretty conservative in his economic policies. But at the same time, he did a lot to <coughs> reduce extreme poverty. So if you look here, th this is reduction of poverty. So for example, this the red line is people that have le uh, <coughs> less than $2 a day. So that's one of the UN's measures. That has gone up, down a lot, and uh, extreme poverty is the green one. So this whole reduction in poverty, people are moving from here to middle class. There was, for example, the, the government uh, paid families if families had no, uh, if they didn't reach a certain minimum income and the kids were in school, the government was giving them a kind of smaller to so that, that helped to fuel that process. So you have a process of growth also uh, by a lot of people that were excluded from the market basically getting into the middle class and starting to purchase uh, new things. So you, you have that and this expected still to grow uh, in the next 10 years, but not that much. I mean, you have 54 here, 58, but you have lot, even more reduction in the low class and uh, increase in the a and B classes, which are the upper classes. Definition of that also is very, I mean, to be in the upper class here in Brazil, if you earn more than $3,000 a month, you are in the upper class. So 
that, that would not be the same definitions of replace the US, but that's, uh, that would be roughly, in the numbers, depending on the change, rate change, but it's roughly to be there. So, GDP has grown. And then this is a picture that shows the red element is the growth coming from uh, consumption. The growth of the GDP that is explained by a growth in consumption. And the blue is the growth in GDP that is coming from an increase in investments. So you see sometimes investments were negative growth, but consumption was holding the, the, the growth pattern. So mostly consumption that is driving this growth. You have some years where there was a lot of investment going on, some years here during the crisis, positive one in consumption, negative 1.33 in investment. So the GDP fell 0.3%, but it was not a major fall if you compare to other countries. But see, the consumption was still growing. It was investments that were going down, and then rebounded here. And then um, numbers for 2013 were 2.3. I don't have the breakdown in, uh, from investment and consumption, but 2.3. But you see that in 2012 also in, uh, investments were going down. So most of the growth has been driven more by consumption than by investment. Consumption of both is near middle class and uh, the poor is coming into the middle class and investment, uh, interest rates falling, more credit, so you have that dynamic going on. So, summary of the growth years in Brazil. That's very simplified. You get interest rates, more credit available, more demand. More demand, we have to Still, uh, companies have to make more investments to supply that demand, more jobs, more jobs, more demand, more investments, more jobs. We're happy, everybody's happy, more taxes, the government has more revenues, and they get better ratings, and so they can cut further interest rates. That's wonderful. Can you see a problem in that logic? Now that's my professor's side. That's okay. <laughs> what is a problem in that, that logic? That's good, but there is one possible issue with a growth led by that process. All this is internal growth. Um, so this is only led by the consumption, um, and not, no money is actually coming from outside. Yeah, I, I, I'm not addressing that point for that. That's uh, there is a whole. Uh, foreign direct investment flows and exchange rate flows and also this has a huge influence on that and you have so the, there is a, another dynamics going on there on terms of uh, foreign direct investment flows but even if we exclude that there's still a problem here is it assuming that the people one they're going to pay back their credit and then that the government's going to use the money like with integrity well but even if we assume that this is going to happen there is still a problem do you have people with education that can fill those jobs? Job supply is not infinite. Okay, if you are generating more jobs and you are following this growth, at some point, what starts to happen? Could be, but I'll, in terms of <clears throat> however much you keep on investing, it is not going to create any more jobs. So that there is a productivity from so, here there. So, so when there are no more jobs, the so the price, is that yeah, and growing. the price of jobs start to go up. So salaries start to go up, which creates pressures for inflation. Yes. Which then means that we cannot cut interest rates. We should increase interest rates, and then we get into the other dynamics which Brazil has been suffering from that for decades, which is high interest rates, low investments, less people working, and you get trapped into this other dynamics, which seems to be going on the past two years. So cost of labor going up here compared to uh, China and Mexico. So uh, the average wage per hour going up a lot. And also for MBAs, still the case, you can get better wages in Brazil than in US. So Brazil is a good destination. Lab labor has a strong hand, especially if you have specialized skills. So, uh, cost of labor going up, productivity has not grown a lot. This whole kind of growth has been based on demand, 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 uh, but productivity, 
productivity has grown in agriculture. Brazil is pretty strong in agriculture, and there has been a lot of productivity increase in agriculture. Here is uh, the finance segment. But the other segments of uh, the industry, they have not been going up. Uh, the average has been 1%, less than 1% a year over uh, from 2000 to 2009. That's not very good. I mean, you are having a pattern of growth that is led by consumption, but not led by productivity growth. So uh, that's not good because then you're going to face these issues of not enough labor, price of labor, and uh, you get trapped into the other dynamics that uh, brings a lot of growth. Taxes are high. This is the first taxes as percentage of GDP going up in this period, so getting to around 36, 37 percent. Investments are pretty low, fixed asset investment compared to uh, US, Chile, India, and China. So these are more growth countries. You see a lot more investment going on uh, in these countries that are in similar kind of stages of growth. And uh, Brazil has been uh, quite low. So. 2013, the economist has the follow-up to their kind of. Uh, so that's the yeah. Remember the original one is here. See, it's gorgeous. That's a bit of the British humor that they have. Uh, okay. 2013. We start the process of interest rates rising again. And they rise, 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 rise. Sadly, inflate, to fight inflation, see, inflation was going up, up, up. The, uh, the central bank has some, uh, the target is uh, 4%, but they can go up to 6 So it's going over the, 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 the maximum of the target. So how do you control inflation? Raise it, rephrase to reduce money supply. So, interest rates going up, 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 up. They're currently at 11. Real interest rates going up, up, up. And then you start to attract, once again, a foreign capital that only goes there for carry trade, that is only going for the difference in interest rate. Because there is a lot of inflow of new money because interest rates are going up, the currency becomes stronger. Brazilian uh, companies become less competitive abroad. And then you reinforce the cycle of, so companies are less competitive because of the exchange rate. Uh, there is a uh, higher cost for uh, lending. The whole kind of virtual cycle breaks down and you start to be concerned. And then the stock market, if you analyze since May 2012, that's uh, Dow Jones and that's Ibovespa. So expectations about future earnings of the companies going down, people are getting more into a negative outlook for, for Brazil. So, what is the problem with Brazil then? In more general terms, supply. Supply has been a huge problem. Demand is not a problem. People like to buy things a lot. If you have enough supply at the right price, people will buy. That, that's, not a problem. that's not Japan's problem where people save too much. People in Brazil, they spend everything they have. <laughs> and if you look at savings rate, also Brazil's savings rate has been declining. The savings rate of emerging markets has been going up in the past few years. Brazil's savings rate has been declining. People are spending, spending, spending. So the problem is supply. So why Brazil has a problem with supply? Uh, if you can find the right answer, maybe you get a double prize. Uh, there are multiple possible answers. And probably all of them explain a little bit of the, of the issue. Lack of infrastructure has been a problem for a long time. And yes, uh, the, the questions that people ask nowadays, what do they ask? Will things be ready for the World Cup and for the Olympics? And my standard answer is, of course they will. In the Brazilian way, they will be <laughs> kind of 80% ready. They will put a nice makeup. They will, the people will be very friendly, and they will try to Conquer by charm, not by efficiency. So, um, lack of infrastructure. I mean, if you look at, I mean, most of Brazil, uh, agriculture is really powerful. It's uh, the center of the country. Most of the agriculture to export, you have to go to the ports. There are the seaside. It's done by roads. 
doves, rail roads, but roads. And most of those roads are in bad shape. So we have huge problems, losses, inefficiencies in that the whole uh, uh, value chain of the agriculture because of infrastructure problems. Uh, if you have been to Brazil and you have flown into either the Sao Paulo or Rio International Airport, it's a shame compared to uh, Beijing or compared to Delhi or to whatever emerging market you are talking about. Uh, there's issue of high taxes, but high taxes has to be taken with a caveat. Brazil has huge taxes for products, depending on the product, and it, it's, it, it really varies by product. So it's not like here that you know the sales tax is such in a state and that applies to everybody. Uh, it can vary from 3, 4% to 80% product taxes. Most are in the 30, 40% range, which is huge. And Brazil has low income taxes. The maximum uh, marginal rate is 27.5%. So people that earn a lot of money, if you earn a lot of money, move to Brazil. It's very good in terms of taxes. <laughs> You're not going to pay a lot, which is a weird system because then the wealthy pay proportionally much, much less taxes than the poor, because the poor are buying, I mean, the, the products that are buying every day, they have huge uh, taxes. So uh, so it's a uh, tax reform in Brazil has been urgent for the last 25 years, and Brazilian sense of urgency is not necessarily uh, <laughs> the same. So uh, that has been a problem. And then the, there's a whole issue of too much government spending, whether that's right or not. And I mean, you have multiple models in the world, governments that spend more or less. But the, the issue of the tax system is unfair and it's, it, it needs kind of a, a change. I said the, the problem with corruption in Brazil is that people do not do it well. I've seen corruption in the world. And in other countries, it's more elegant. In Brazil, it's just people don't know how to do it. So I think it was problematic about that. But, uh, uh, there are inefficiencies. Clear. Labor loss, very inflexible. So it's very hard to hire and fire people. So it's uh, very inflexible. So whenever you have demand is going up, supply going up takes a longer time because of labor loss. So part of the supply problem is that very rigid labor loss. Consumerism. That may be, I mean, people don't save. People spend a lot of money, so it's hard to have enough savings on the country for investment. Everybody's spending, spending, spending. Chronic, uh, we'll talk more about that. But Brazilian capitalism is like in some other countries. It's a very small group of interconnected people that dominates that. So that that's changes incentives, changes behaviors of companies. So that's something that we'll get more into that now the whole Brazilian business culture. So understanding those things, uh, the more micro things related to culture, it's important to understand some of the macro problems that Brazil faces. And it's probably a combination of all those things are, are, are important to understand that. So some opportunities so you don't have to press. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, this should be key for many years. So if you are in industries that are related to infrastructure, Brazil will still be a very important destination for your investments. Could be if you if you are able to manage that well. Uh, the, 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 the need for infrastructure will be there for many years to come. A lot of room for growth in credit. Remember those numbers comparing Brazil credit with other countries. So there is a lot to. I mean that if we get Brazil gets into the virtual cycle again of uh, cutting interest rates. Cut, there is still a lot of possible demand there. Inefficiencies, if you are, there is a lot of work for consultants there. If you can spot those inefficiencies and change and, and uh, suggest better ways of doing things. Consumerism, the pay of, if you are in consumer goods industry, that's great. Go to Brazil, they will spend huge amounts of money to buy your product. So, right away, but be prepared for volatility. What happens in consumption? This huge volatility. I mean, when things are going well, people are buying a lot of things, and now that things are not going very well, shuts down completely, so results go down, and then we'll go up again probably in one or two years. So, well, Brazil is a country of volatility. By, I mean, if you look at the stock market, it's a great opportunity for those that like volatility, that profit from volatility. Things are much more volatile than uh, US. So, 
let's understand a little bit of the micro problems this girl needs to uh, present in this sculpture. So I uh, will uh, rely on research done by a friend that uh, he teaches at a business school in Sao Paulo and he published a quite interesting book. Uh, he was out for a sabbatical at Harvard four years, five years ago and he then gathered some data about that and then he wrote this book. And the book has had quite a, quite a, I mean, a lot of people read it and commented about it. So trying to give a picture of how Brazilian companies are connected. So one interesting thing that we have in Brazil, a lot of the major companies in Brazil, so OI is the uh, number one telecommunications company, Vale, the ROR mining company, Embraer, the airplanes company, they have kind of the same owners. And who are the owners? Well, there are some private investors, uh, but if you, they're present everywhere, it's a pension fund from the from people that work in the Banco do Brasil, which is the federal state bank, so Pervi, their patient fund, they have participation in most of the major companies in Brazil, sometimes a sizable participation, so they see on board, etc. And this is the social development bank. Brazil's social development bank gives loans at very competitive rates to companies. Remember, the interest rates there, the real interest rates were like 10% of the uh, nominal interest rates could be 20%. At that time, the Brazil Social Development Bank was lending money at 4%. But then you have to get that loan. How do you get that loan? That's uh, something that you apply and you... Uh, but then there is the poor opportunity for political interference, depending on who is in power or not. So the Social Development Bank also but has shares in different companies. So you have a, a, a kind of, the, the companies are linked, not directly, but indirectly through their owners. So if you look at ownership linkages among companies, you see there is clustering, and the companies are very related, and that those are joint ownership kind of relations. Not only that, a lot of board members are the same. So this is the same group of people that are participating in uh, a lot of different boards. And if you look at, uh, we did a network analysis, so a measure of agglomeration. So if you took a random kind of network and you compare it to the Brazil network, uh, Brazil network is, has uh, 40 times more agglomeration. <laughs> It's really dense. It's really everybody is connected there pretty tightly. And it has gone up. You know, during those growth years where Brazil was growing, uh, you have more and more of those relations, so joint relations with the So who became more central? So this is the participation of uh, pension funds from state companies. The pension funds from state companies became a much more important player in terms of ownership of companies in Brazil during this period from 1960 to 2009. This is the Social Development Bank. So a lot of the growth in the ownership side have been not private investors making investments in companies, but pension funds from state companies and Social Development Bank making investments in those companies. So uh, yes, it's a capitalism of private companies. But behind that, we have a lot of quasi-state players owning those companies, which opens the door for the political influence and a lot of things that might uh, divert the companies from their objective, which is part of the problem that Petrobras has been facing. There are a lot of scandals related to making bad decisions because so that, uh, there are concerns about that type of dynamics going on. Uh, so what? So what are the effects on performance? That's the follow-up study that he's still doing to still compare performance uh, across those multiple groups. Maybe having more of that pension funds and social development, maybe companies become more profitable with that. Maybe. So so we have. Uh, he's still going through the empirical testing of that to see the uh, effects on performance. What is the role of government through direct and direct links? Effects on industry structure. We will we would need a whole. They need to discuss that, so but that, that's one important to mention there that government has become a more important player. And if you are a foreign company, should you get into that small world, should you 
attract people, board members, etc. There are that, or should they try to fight and say no? Exactly, that's an opportunity because they're they are more they may be more inefficient <coughs> by having all those connections. So uh, that, that that's something for you to consider if you want to do business there. Last segment on. So we looked at the macro economic, and then we looked at this ownership structure, how companies are linked. Now let's go to the real micro issue of cross-cultural business. You want to do business there because you think, okay, there are opportunities. We think that this kind of Brazil will get into the virtual cycle again. And uh, so that's what you will face there. I'm not, I'm not, I won't try to explain everything. Here, that's a model that uh, another friend there in Brazil, she and the co-author, they interviewed a lot of companies, they developed multiple case studies, and they came up with those characteristics of the Brazilian cultural system for uh, in, in, in companies. And there are some things here. For example, Brazilians don't like conflict of conflict. They uh, so a lot of negotiations have to be based. You have to take that into account. Flexibility, that's the World Cup story. Will we be ready by the World Cup? <laughs> giving German standards, no, but given Brazilian flexible standards, yes. Sure. So we, we, we can't always change the rules. And that's another thing that goes on. The rules are always changing anyway. Uh, it's formal, it's very bureaucratic. So there, there's a lot of formalism in the bureaucratic relations, so that's an important uh, thing. And there is this paternalism, personalism, and impunity together, this thing about uh, if he's my friend and he's the, they are both applying to a job, he's my friend, he's the best qualified people, I will hire him. No one, no question about him. Not in all companies. That by, I mean, if you have some companies, the guys that bought Burger King, Heinz, etc. It's a very different model. They are very US kind of style, direct. So, so, so they saw this as an opportunity to create value in Brazil. They said, let's do a different model where we can. Uh, have some advantages, but on an average company, you find a lot of that power concentration. If you, they interviewed manager after a merger between a Brazil and U.S. company, they interviewed the managers some years later, and then the managers from um, the U.S. side saw okay, that the Brazilian managers have this sense of kind of huge hierarchical sense that, like the top manager, right, like gods, and you never respond to them and you always accept what they say. Whereas the Brazilians were telling about the Americans, these Americans, they don't respect their bosses, they're always kind of, so there is this, uh, uh, it's quite different in terms of power expectation. There is a bit of passivity also, people just waiting for things to happen. If you don't tell them what to do, they won't do it. <laughs> so, and I faced that problem in, uh, when I was, my dissertation I did, I spent one year in a plant of a European company that was opening their first auto plant in Brazil. So I was interacting with the two communities, the expatriates and the locals. And the ex since I also spoke the language of the expatriates, the expatriates came to me and said, those guys don't do anything. I talked to the Brazilians and said, those guys never tell us what to do. So there is this. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to play the kind of organizational shrink there and come to explain the culture. So loyalty to people is very important, connections are very important. If you put this together with what we saw in the previous slides of the connections between companies, you see there is a very personal type of capitalism, not necessarily based on merit, but based on the relationships you have. Which is not very different from a lot of other countries. It's just less efficient problem than some other countries. Uh, some suggestions then of a specific cultural elements, how, how can you react to those loyalty to people, you need to establish personal relations to get things done. That's the best way to get things done. was uh, giving a short course for a company here that has operations in Brazil, and one of their managers was saying, when I ask them something that I really need for next week or something, how, how can I increase my chances of that they will actually do it? Uh, I told her, Call them every week. Not when you need something. Call them every week to talk about things. Establish that personal relationship. So now, when you need it, 
ask that favor for, the, for their friends. So it's not that they're doing it because they're required by their job. It's because that person has called us every week and we know her and we talk to her. So we will do that as a favor to her. So that, that happened. So peer, peer feedback may bias, people may cover up for their colleagues. So you need to get into the formal networks. You need to get into the gossip network to know what's really going on. If you are an expatriate just working there from a hierarchical perspective looking at things, you won't know what's going on. Try to get into the informal networks as much as you can. How do you get? Start playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible at soccer, but when I was there in the plant, I had to do it. So what's going on? Uh, people love to express their emotions. I have some videos that sometimes I show. Uh, the Apprentice, there is a Brazilian version of The Apprentice, the TV series, and look at the reaction of people in US versus Brazil. It's very funny. In US, they are all and when they're receiving the feedback, in, in Brazil they cry, they jump, or Expression of emotions is important. Uh, don't sound threatening or aggressive when giving negative feedback, so we're trying to get to a solution. Deal with conflict in smaller groups. Opening, deal with conflict in a larger group openly. It's not very well received because there is conflict avoidance. People don't like to see conflict. Uh, so don't openly confront people in front of others. Some other things. People expect you to tell them what to do if you're their boss, but uh, when you're doing teamwork, also they, they, they like more participative process, they like to engage in a more uh, uh, kind of collective process. Coaching, mentoring people is important to develop their leadership skills. And last one, flexibility. Plans that are too rigid won't be well received. If you have rigid plans, they will react strongly against that. And they will do things in the last minute. Uh, you can ask for last minute things, but don't make everything urgent. That's another perception of that those interviews between the Brazil and US after the Brazil US merger, the Brazilian managers said, US managers, everything is urgent for them. But they're always asking for urgent things. So uh, if you say that everything is urgent, they will discount your urgent and it will become like a flexible urgent. Uh, so people see that lines as flexible, be sure to break long projects into smaller components, measure progress frequently. Don't, if you have something to be done six months from now, break into things that you can measure every month or every 15 days. Because if it's only measured six months from now, they will start doing month five and a half. <laughs> so, uh, everything has a solution. That's a good, that's a great part. People are very flexible. And that's the jeitinho, which is the president. And that there is always a workaround. There is always a solution for any problem. So if you need something for tomorrow that seems impossible, people will try to find a way. And they will. Uh, so they, they are very open to that, to flexible, different solutions that are not necessarily by the book. Of course, this workaround pro, uh, culture is a threat to quality programs. If you are, if you are responsible for ISO 9000 or something, that that's going to be a major issue because people like flexibility, they like the work around, so you have to uh, talk about the importance of compliance. This is a message that you have always to give to the people that uh, compliance is important and then also give incentives and monitoring to, to see. So, uh, we would need to uh, around 100 hours to start getting to actionable items, so that's uh, I will better stop here. So uh, the first thing is, I mean, if you have some experience of doing business in Brazil, or if you want to do business in Brazil, keep in touch with us. I mean, share your stories, etc. The, the, the more we share on that, the more we learn. So the main thing. But the MB Emerging Markets Club, they will start a newsletter that they, they were promising. So now it's official. They will start a newsletter <laughs> during fall. Uh, and in that newsletter, we will discuss things about, so there will always be one of our faculty, we have expertise in multiple countries, so it's going to be a, an article about what's going on in one country or region of the world, and we may have some kind of forums, maybe online forums, where people can debate that, some new ideas that we can I can see you're, you're just riffing now. I like yeah, so, uh, Don't worry, they're all flexible then. <laughs> <laughs> He was in Brazil, who was part of the Blue Business in Brazil for us, so... Yeah. So, questions? Comments? The real rate has been fluctuating recently. What's causing the rate? You wouldn't have so far up as 245, now it's back down to 220. 
six months ago, eight months ago was 205. <coughs> Yeah, and then two years ago was 1.7, 1.6. Yes. Right. It got down to. So why it was getting stronger? Quantitative easing in US. I mean, uh, the interest rates in US were negative. In Brazil, though they were going down, they were still quite attractive. A lot of investors started flowing money into emerging markets, and Brazil was one of the major ones because fixed income there still paid a lot of money. Huge inflow of money. Brazilian currencies start to get stronger. stronger. The rates, the, the real rate goes down. Yeah, so the real, the, the dollar price, so 1.8, 1.7, so it's like this. Government starts to get worried because Brazilian companies lose competitiveness. Right. So we need to do something about it. So the government starts to do some intervention. The, the, the exchange rate is free, free floating, but the government starts buying or selling because the government has huge reserves, so they can. Whenever they, they, they see, okay, let's start to uh, buy or sell to bring those rates more uh, to what we want. And what we want is not very clear, but at that point, 1.6 was too strong. The Brazilian currency was too strong. So we started that uh, process. In the middle of the process, what happened? Emerging markets started to, uh, investors worldwide start to see, oh, emerging markets are not maybe that great. The perception of emerging markets are changing. And also, likely, uh, the U.S. will end the QE and the, profit, the interest rates in the U.S. will go down. So let's bring money back. So we have a huge outflow of money. And the, the exchange rate starts to, so now Brazil gets weak, the currency gets weaker, 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 get to a point that once again, well, first the government was happy with that, but then it started to get to a point that Brazil has inflation. The, the, the threat of inflation is going up. With an interest rate that is that the Brazilian currency is too weak, imports become too expensive. And imports is one of the ways to fight inflation. If you can have more imports, you would stabilize. So the Brazilian government says, okay, we're not. We don't want that to appreciate anymore. Maybe we even want to go down a little bit. And then what you have seen in the past few two weeks or so is the investors started to see, once again, the stock market as one opportunity for investment. If you see there is an uptick on the stock market, uh, then uh, you start to have investors coming once again, saying, OK, probably here, companies are undervalued or something, so, so let's put some money. Plus, the interest rates are going up again because of the dynamics that I showed, more interesting to do carry trade again, so we can have better. So inflow of money once again, interest rate now in Brazil, Real becoming slightly stronger. So now it's around 220. Right. Uh, volatility will, will still happen because of those trends. I mean, there are some things that is completely outside the control. It's investors making decisions based on what's going on in the world. The government has some objectives, but the objectives keep moving because the trend of inflation is there. We, government first wanted exports to be more uh, competitive, so they wanted a weaker currency. And then suddenly, because of the inflation threats, we want imports to be cheaper. Now we want a stronger currency. So that, that, that the direction of the what the government wants also changes to be under with the direction of the inflow of food. So, uh, things in Brazil are unpredictable. What will happen with the stock market? I don't know. What will happen with the exchange rate? I don't know. I only know that Petrobras is their bad. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in passing that uh, uh, the productivity in Brazil has hit a brick wall, pun intended. Uh, and uh, can you elaborate more as to what the reasons are? Is it related to training, uh, to education, or to maybe supply chains? Uh, and, and that's that's something that people are trying to explain. And that I mean, there 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 was a book that was out last month from two economists with data from the band last year, and and. It's probably all of the above, in a sense. Well, the bureaucracy, the whole bureaucracy, it's very difficult to, if you look at the easiness of doing business that the World Bank has ranked and so that, it's very hard to do business in Brazil in terms of bureaucracy. It's very hard to open a company. It's very hard to close a company. So there is this whole, the inflexibility in a lot of things that would help you to be more productive. Import 
uh, machines. It's not an easy process. So there, there are a lot of problems in that uh, element. Uh, and the other is maybe explainable by the Brazilian business culture. What happened when the demand started to go up? Instead of making investments to expand supply and increase productivity, we better charge more and have a higher margin. So we're not necessarily interested in having um, more, being more productive, but we can charge, we can increase our prices and we can keep our margins pretty healthy through that. But then you have to charge. So we have individual agents making some decisions that are not necessarily good for the country as a whole, but that will backfire in the future for them. Uh, so there could be some explanations related to the culture. There are explanations, of course, related to the education system. This is a very, the basic education, the uh, public education is not good. The public education at the university level is very good, and it's free. So what happens, the people that go to the private schools, the wealthier people, then go to a public university and don't pay anything for the public university, which is a perverse system that has been changing now. The government has uh, reserving some uh, places for people that come from a low income background. Uh, but it's still a very elite system. If, if you see that the uh, require, I mean, if Brazil kept growing at those paces like 2010, 7% or something, there wouldn't be enough skills. So, what you started to see also? Immigrants coming to the country. The last wave of immigrants was back in the 30s. Now we're starting to have a wave of skilled immigrants. So you go around some Paulo, you see more people speaking English, etc. You see more pockets of immigrants coming, and so so there is the limitation on the skilled labor side that has been also one of the major barriers for for productivity. Plus the whole hard to make investments, etc. So the whole bureaucracy is another issue, and a bit more conservative also. Whenever uh, the, 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 the their investment plans are not necessarily very optimistic, so they're pushing back on investments sometimes. So Investment based on low potential public rules Questions? Risk mitigation. <coughs> Sir? Risk mitigation is a huge problem. It's yes. a very, I've been in Brazil. The risk mitigation issue that you face in terms of your investments uh, in relationship to the old extraordinary use of insurance and other forms of uh, mitigation issues, it, it is a huge problem to figure out in relationship to doing business there because you have to figure out how to manage your risk. Yep. And, uh, and things are very volatile. So it's, it's extremely volatile. There's nothing there that anybody tells you today may turn out to be the same thing tomorrow. Uh, yeah, the, 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 there are constant changes on the regulation side. And sometimes the government okay, opens a bidding process for, for example, there are a lot of public-private partnerships for logistics. You build a road, then you'll be able to charge X in the toll fares or something. They do that bidding. And then one year later, they change the rules and say, no, we're not going to be able to charge that anymore. So then people are saying, well, I'm not investing that anymore because the still risk and don't know what's Yeah, we've had a problem with us in a few weeks. The concession there in terms of the port that was supposed to build built there it didn't happen. And then, and then you, you, you have your plans based on the idea that the port was going to actually be built. And once the ports comes up and says, oh, well, we changed our mind. Yeah. And then it turns out to be that uh, now you're looking at either going into Swapi and Ponacuco or you're going to Seen in Sierra. And the railroad's supposed to be ready in 2014. It's not ready. Maybe it'll be ready in 2015. So you got all these issues you're trying to figure out. And as you know, because the, the roads are not paved, uh, the extraordinary problem moving stuff in relationship to trucks. And sometimes they have to the axles in the mud uh, in the rain seasons. So, uh, then you go back and you start to figure out, try to figure out, from the standpoint of the amount of investment that you're doing, based on the risk that you're taking, and then you go back and sit down and start sitting to your investors. And, you know, people want to know, okay, how are you going to mitigate this? Yeah. And that becomes a huge thing to answer. And the there is no clear answer, except if you can offer, okay, that's a higher risk, higher return kind of investment, but that's the, on the positive side, things are more stable than they used to be in the past. <laughs> 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 the so if you see this as a trend, maybe things will get better in the future, but that's still very hard because the priorities keep changing also. That 
it's uh, something that uh, and now, now it's election year in Brazil, so there is uh, the contenders Dilma, who is in power for the last three and a half years, and she will probably be elected. Uh, but the, the now the her ratings are going down and down because Brazil is not uh, perception. People are not very optimistic. So so that and now. Also, investors are reacting to that, and that, that there are multiple expectations. So this year is going to be a year of huge volatility because of the election. So whenever a new survey is out on the press about what's the ratings of the president, etc., things may go up and down widely because of that uncertainty. That, that, that's uh, kind of a macro uncertainty on the political side that will drive some of those. And year of election, nothing gets really decided a lot. Things are below. Yeah, they will do some things to get votes. So, so, so that, that that's a huge issue. And, and maybe remember also, Brazilian companies suffering from that. When when the Brazilian currency was becoming stronger and stronger, a lot of exporters, uh, there was Sadia, for example, food uh, exporter company, they did hedging in one direction because the currency was getting stronger and stronger. And the stronger the currency was, the worse for them in terms of doing business abroad. They hit, they did hedging in one direction, and then the currency suddenly jumped in the other direction. They had a huge liability. They practically went bankrupt. They had to work with another company. Not because their operations were bad. Not, they were very healthy operationally, but for because of their financial hedging, because they wanted to mitigate risk, they almost went bankrupt because the <coughs> currency went in the unexpected direction. So that's terrible in a sense. You see a great company going down because of this kind of type of, uh, uh, an attempt of financial hedging that didn't work in uh, the direction of it. So financial hedging is not the answer. I mean, so you cannot hedge because of un unpredictability and the volatility is very hard to do that. We're just about out of time. How about we just take two quick questions together and you can answer them together and we'll wrap up. Last two. Could you talk a little bit more about what makes a company undervalued, like Petrobras or something? The, the people got very pessimistic about the interference of government on Petrobras. But at the same time, if you look at the app, what the company has in terms of what discoveries, future productivity, if you look at what they have there currently, it's being discounted because this perception of instability but I mean, I, I've done, I've worked with them, I've done consulting for their area, and, and they're right. I mean, the, 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 the technical people, they are the engineers, etc. they are there forever. They say, it doesn't matter a lot what the top does. I mean, the top <coughs> keeps changing because the government appoints the top managers. Uh, that keeps changing, and that may lead to some bad decisions. But the company, the viability of the company in the long run is all these people that are not political appointees, they're very technical, very good people that's uh, very hard to get into, to be hired by Petrobras. So they, they have the resources and capabilities to make it happen. Even if the government changes and people there change and they make one or two bad decisions, it doesn't explain. I mean, their share prices in, in, in the Brazilian market was, uh, they were around 40 something. Five years ago, they are now around, 16 or something like that. So he, 40 was too optimistic, 16 is too pessimistic. So that, that's a clear case, but some other clear case, some other cases are not that clear. Can you expand upon the clean energy or maybe opportunities for Brazil in the future? Well, a, a lot of the clean energy is hydroelectric power because Brazil has a lot of rivers, it's just nature, and it's just, I mean, people are by, uh, building now the small hydroelectric power plants, so sometimes they have a very small one. So that, that there is there, and plus ethanol, which has been kind of a government induced uh, effort back in the 80s to, to be less dependent on oil. So those are the two major ones. Clean energy like solar, well, solar Brazil uses for water heating, but not a lot, still not a lot for other types of uh, energy. And wind is increasing. There has some, there has been some activity in different parts of the country. So there are opportunities there in wind. There are some opportunities in solar. Ethanol has been established in Brazil for long, so it's not that you can change a lot of that structure. And uh, hydroelectric, the pain, I mean, 
yeah, you also have the dominance of a few players that it's uh, hard to break into that. So, so there, there could be an opportunity in those kind of emerging technologies. But remember, that since Brazil has a lot of, I mean, almost 50% is already clean. I don't know if the incentives are there necessarily. I don't know if the government will give huge incentives for people to build clean power. Because it doesn't need basic, it doesn't have reverb. All right, I think we're going to have to close it down. Uh, we're already over time, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your time.